Hello, it's Bob Steele. In this video, we will continue on chapter eight, learning objective number six, which is to evaluate absorption and variable costing. So we're going to continue on to the next year and move forward and look at the differences between these two methods. So let's look at the second year of operations of Mellon Company. So in the second year of operations, Mellon Company started with an inventory of 5,000 units, produced 25,000 units and sold 30,000 units at $30. So the data here, real quick on the data, Number of units produced annually, 25,000. Variable cost per unit. So we have the direct material, the direct labor, and the variable overhead. These are all things that change with production, and they are adding up to 10 per unit. Selling and administrative, 3 per unit. Those are the variable costs. On the fixed cost portion, we have the manufacturing overhead and selling and admin at the 150 and the 100, respectively. We're going to move on to some more data here. We have the units produced. Unit product cost is determined as follows. So we have the absorption versus the variable. Remember that the absorption is the one that will include the difference being the fixed manufacturing overhead. So under the absorption, we're going to take that 150,000 fixed manufacturing overhead, divide that by 25,000 units to give us that $6 per unit, bringing our uh, unit product cost to 16. Whereas under the variable cost method, we will only include the variable cost of the manufacturing, which is only 10. So now let's look at Mellon's income statement, assuming absorption costing is used. So we're going to go to the traditional, the absorption cost in here, which has the sales 30,000 times 30. That's the 900. Less cost of goods sold. We had a beginning inventory of 5,000 times 16, that larger number, which includes the, very, the fixed portion of overhead, gives us the 80,000 add cost of goods manufactured the 25,000 times that 16 again gives us the 400 the 80 plus the 400 gives the 480 and we have no ending inventory therefore the 480 minus 0 gives us the 480 the gross profit is the 900 minus the 480 gives us the 420 then we're going to take out the fixed cost which will be the variable um, I'm sorry we're going to we're going to take out the selling and administrative which includes the variable portion of 30,000 times 3 gives us the 90 and the fixed portion of the 100. Those add up to the 190,000. And if we subtract these out, the 420 minus the 190 gives us uh, the 230. So our net income here being the 230. So next we'll look at Mellon's income statement, assuming variable costing is used. So we're going to contrast that to the second method being the variable costing method. So we have sales, the sales being the same, 30,000 times 30. But we're going to subtract now less the variable expenses. So we have the same type of calculation here. We have the beginning inventory, which is the 5,000 difference being that we're going to multiply it times 10. Remember that 10 is lower because it's not including the fixed portion of the manufacturing overhead gives us the 50,000. We're going to add to that the cost of goods manufactured, 25,000. Once again, times 10, the lower number, giving us the 250,000. The 50 plus the 250 gives us the 300 cost of goods available for sale. We generally subtract out ending inventory. There is none in this case. Therefore, the cost of goods uh, sold is the 300,000. Now we're going to keep, we're going to include up here in the variable cost section the variable selling and administrative expenses which are the 30,000 times 3 giving us the 90,000 if we add the 300 plus the 90 we got 390 that's our total uh, variable expenses and we're going to take the the 900 minus the 390 gives us this new number we haven't talked about under the absorption method the contribution margin which is sales less variable costs that then we're going to subtract out just the fixed portion we're breaking out the fixed portion separately which includes manufacturing overhead, selling and admin, adds up to 250, and we come up with the uh, 510 minus the 250 gives us the 260 net income. So if we summarize the, these two periods, we have the income comparison costing, we have the absorption and the variable. In period one, uh, we had the 120 versus the 90, in period two, we had the 230 versus the 260. The thing we're pointing out here is that through the two-year period, they will be the same. So if we were to do an income statement over a two-year period, we would end up with the same net income. So the idea being is, is that the, 
the, the difference between these two methods is a timing difference. There's a timing difference as to when the expenses would be expensed, but in the long run, uh, it would it would come out the same. So the whole concept here has to do with a timing difference. In the first period, production of 25,000 units was greater than the sales of 20,000 units. So in period one, we produced 25,000 units. We only sold 20,000 units. Therefore, we had 5,000 units more that we made that were still in ending inventory as of the end of the time period. In the second period, production was 25,000 units was less than sales. So in the second period, uh, we, we produced less than we actually sold. How can we do that? Because we had stuff in beginning inventory in order to do that. So let's take a look at the effect. That's what's kind of driving the effect on the timing differences. So for the two year period, total, total absorption income and total variable income are the same as we just talked about. So let's see if we can get an overview of what we have done. All right, summary here. So summary, comparison, absorption, and variable costing. We're going to use the AC and the VC in order to abbreviate here. So remember that the production versus sales, uh, when production is uh, produced is greater than what is sold, what's going to happen to the inventory? The inventory is going to go up because we produce more stuff than we sold. Therefore, our ending inventory will go up. So the effect, so the period cost effect, uh, fixed manufacturing cost expensed is going to be greater in that case under uh, the absorption costing than under the variable costing. So fixed manufacturing cost expenses, I'm sorry, fixed manufacturing cost expense will be less under the absorption than the variable cost. And that's because the variable cost is going to expense the entire period cost of the fixed manufacturing cost. Whereas on the absorption costing method, those expenses will be in ending inventory, which have not yet been expensed. When will they be expensed? When we sell the stuff and cost the goods sold. So that's what's resulted in the timing difference, which results in, uh, in this case, when produce, when produced more than sold, absorption costing will be greater than variable costing, uh, the effect on net income. So this was caused by the first period when produced 25,000 units was greater than the 20,000 units sold. So we saw that in the first period, this is what happened. Inventory increased from zero to 5,000 units and 120,000 absorption income was greater than the 90,000 variable income. Okay, so in, in the second period, what would happen if we produced less than what we sold? That would mean that inventory would go down because we sold more than we produced. How can we do that? Because we had stuff in inventory from last period. So the total effect on inventory, well, inventory would decrease. And the opposite would be the effect there. So the fixed manufacturing cost expense would be greater than under the absorption cost and than the variable costing. Why? Because we're expensing those fixed costs on the income statement now uh, under the, the absorption costing method, whereas in the variable costing, we would expense them when they would have been incurred, which would have happened last period. And so now the effect on profit absorption costing is less than variable costing in the second period sales was 30,000 units uh, we were greater than the pr produced of 25 so the example that we showed in the second period this is what happened so inventory decreased from 5,000 units to zero and 230,000 absorption income was less than the 260 variable income and so for the two-year period units produced equals units sold so total absorption income equals total variable income. So the example that we took a look at shows the, the, the two differences and shows that, that the two amounts are just timing differences in the long run. So why do we have these two differences? We've discussed this a little bit before, but uh, many managers like the, the variable costing method for, for some of these reasons. And it, it deviates from the, the traditional method, the GAP, the me method for financial statements, which would be the, the absorption method that we have learned. And the reason some managers like this, and there's a debate on this, would be that um, manager finds it easy to understand because uh, many of the, the decision-making tools that they use deal with cost volume, including cost volume profit analysis. And the break-even analysis uh, often deals with us breaking up 
the costs by their behavior, not by what goes into production. So uh, a lot of our decision making that we're going to talk about deals with um, breaking out the variable costs from the fixed costs. So it emphasizes contribution in the short run pricing decisions. So if we're making a short run decision, we'll talk about these types of decisions later, we're often going to find the differences in the two decisions. And notice that fixed costs often are not in the difference between a short run decision because we would if the rent is the rent we would have to pay the rent anyways so why are we including that in the decision making process of a one-time sale or something like that so many managers would say that it, it allows people to make easy short-term decisions that could be profitable profit for the period not affected by changes in fixed manufacturing overhead so and there's an uh, an impact of fixed cost on profit is is emphasized so on the other hand, the absorption, some managers like the absorption costing method, and many of those managers would be looking more in the, in the long run. If you have the more of a, of a long run kind of uh, costing perspective, then the absorption makes sense. And you can see why they originally came up with the absorption method. If, so mix, so fixed uh, manufacturing overhead is treated the same as the other uh, product costs, direct cost and uh, direct labor. So if we're really looking at the cost of producing something, it does include all that stuff. It includes it includes the rent on the factory. It includes the the price, the the cost it takes for the supervisor. It includes all those small materials and, and or, or uh, in, any other kind of fixed items in there. So even though they have a different costing behavior, if we're really trying to figure out the the true cost of something, we we would need to account for those in some way. So on, when we're doing a long term pricing model. Uh, it would make sense to use some kind of uh, absorption method. When we're trying to find short-term decisions and changes, it's often thought that uh, the absorption method is not good because uh, we're already locked into those fixed costs. It's also consistent with long-run pricing decisions that must be must cover full cost, and the external reporting income tax law require absorption costing. So. Obviously, if uh, when we do financial statements, they generally are going to ask for absorption costing, and therefore, if we're publicly traded, and we would have to make the absorption costing, and then we would have to make the the uh, the variable uh, as an internal document. So once again, the question is: Is it worth the the added paperwork that it would take in order to uh, come up with these form uh, the forms that that might be easier for decision making? So there's going to be some kind of uh, profit cost profit analysis to see if the added data is worth gathering okay so note that there's a there's a trend in to just in time inventory so just in time inventory meaning that we're going to keep as little inventory as possible we're going to wait till basically the order happens and then uh, and then produce the inventory and if that is the case notice what that does is it limits the amount in Indian inventory and the differences between these two methods then becomes a lot smaller in a just-in-time inventory system.